you have for us according to your word. And Father, we know that you are a loving God, Father, and we will indeed work harder, Father, to be more pleasing in your sight. Heavenly Father, these things we pray and thank you for in Christ Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The workings of prayer, they have been a mystery for some throughout the ages. For some, uh, prayer seems to be some mind thing do that Christians do to, as a sense of duty. Sometimes it's even used as a, a checklist of something that we need to, to get done. For others, prayer seems to be elusive, difficult for us to, to understand the concept of, and also difficult for us to do. But I have some good news for you today. And the good news is this right here. Prayer is neither one of these things. Prayer is something that is given to us as an honor, if you will, as a way to reach out to our Heavenly Father personally and one-on-one. -on -one. And how awesome is that for us? Prayer is essential to the Christian's life, as just essential, you might say, as breathing, just as essential as eating. It is necessary to stay, or rather to, to stay spiritually connected with God, but also to nourish ourselves in him. So when Christ Jesus' disciples then asked him to teach them to pray, he gladly obliged them because he himself knows the significance of prayer and the power of prayer. So in this lesson this morning, and part of this lesson this morning, what we're going to do is look at four key components that seem to pop out at us as we look at Christ Jesus teaching his disciples to prayer. We're, and these components are also very important because they will help us have a more powerful prayer life as well. And then the good news is this. We are learning from the best in that we are learning from Christ Jesus and that we are sitting at the feet of him and taking in the points that he's pointing out to us as we go through this lesson. A person's life, a person's life speaks volumes, more than words can ever do for us. Most people would judge us by what they see, and what Jesus' disciples saw was a man. They saw a man who was dedicated to prayer. While he walked on the earth, he was known for offering up prayers. He was known for offering up supplications. And he did so with strong crying and with tears. And I say to you, how awesome is it that the disciples could see such a one as he who was doing miracles, but not only that, he was, he was identified as the son of God and still he saw the need to pray. And that's huge for all of us. It lets us know that if our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus needed constant contact with God, our Heavenly Father, in order to live on this earth successfully, so do we. Perhaps this is why his disciples, uh, why a disciple, I should say, of his questioned him on prayer, but questioned him and wanted to know more about how we go about the business of praying. So we find in verse 1 of chapter 11 that after he had finished praying in a certain place, that one of his disciples did indeed uh, ask him to teach him to pray. Now what we're not told there is which disciple it was that asked him the question, and that is not important. The point, what is important is this right here. They wanted to know. And when one sees something genuine, when one sees something real, they want more of it and they want to know how it's done. And I believe Christ Jesus' disciples saw this in him. Asking to be taught the ins and outs of, of such a valuable resource was very important. It was the beginning of a great discovery, if you will, that Jesus was all too willing to share. Now on the slide here that we're looking at, we see four key points that pops out during this particular study on prayer, on the model prayer that our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus taught. Q. 
key number one, one has to have acknowledging prayer. And you see the text there. What we're saying here is this. When one is acknowledging something or someone that they feel deserve or is deserving of such credit, uh, this is what we tend to do. We acknowledge them. Now here, opening up this, his teaching on prayer, Christ Jesus jumps, jumps in without hesitation. He starts out by saying, when you pray, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven. Now notice first that he didn't say if you pray, he said when you pray. And notice also that he's given God all the glory that he deserves. Starting with the statement, our Father who art in heaven, Jesus acknowledges to whom our prayer should be directed. And in the verses following, again, we see that God is getting all the glory that he deserves. God is getting all the credit in everything. This is acknowledging. Acknowledging prayer recognizes God's authority. It recognizes his power, his sovereignty, his control, his kingdom, and his will overall. Acknowledging prayer recognizes that God is the provider of all. Acknowledging prayer knows that forgiveness comes from God. And finally, acknowledging prayer shows that God is the deliverer. Key two, one has to have persevering prayer. Now, the scenario here is a simple one. Someone drops in late at night, unexpected. Due to the lateness of the hour and the unexpected uh, nature of the visit, the, the person that was being visited hadn't had time to actually go bring things together to, to greet this person in, a, in, a, in what you call a great way. Now, there's a proposed solution here. Knock on a neighbor's door, who is a friend, and ask for help. The problem with this solution is this. Again, it's late. They're already in bed. They're already asleep. They can't help. They're probably a little bit upset because you're beating on the door and, not, and waking up the children. Now, Jesus uses... Did I get ahead of myself? A little bit. Here I am. So Jesus uses this scenario. Jesus used this scenario to teach us the power of persevering prayer. One cannot easily uh, give up something. Uh, we have been afforded the privilege, if you will, to come before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We must be persistent in this privilege. One's lack of persistence in prayer can be tied to a lack of faith, but also a powerful key component our prayer is us not giving up too easily, us not giving up too soon. Key number three, one has to have expectant prayer. When one prays, expect to receive an answer. Expect to see some sort of uh, fulfillment to come from our, your prayers. Look for something to happen as a result of our prayers. Even if the answer we don't, that we get is not what we want to hear, we should uh, imagine it could and it should happen. Your prayers do not fall on deaf ears. We, should, we need to understand that. We need to be confident that God hears, hears us, that God is attentive to our needs, and that God does not leave us in a state of wanting. Whatever it is, Keep looking for God to answer. That's the point. Key number four, one has to have believe in prayer. Believe in the goodness of God. That's the first thing we need to think of. Believe in your relationship with him as a child of our heavenly father. Believe that he is always, that, believe that he always seeks to give us the best of everything. Believe that God knows how to answer our prayers. We have to step out of ourselves, though. We have to step out of ourselves and believe with childlike faith, if you will, 
that our Heavenly Father knows, that our Heavenly Father cares about our, our, our petitions that are going up to him. We need to believe it today, and we, do, we need to ask with a believing heart. A believing heart, and he will give. This is a quick transition. We're transitioning now to Luke chapter uh, 13, verse 14, Sabbath day. So God made the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, our Saturday, a holiday, and he set it apart for worship. There were three major reasons given for Israel to keep the Sabbath. We see the text here on the slide, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, which we, refer, which we find the Ten Commandments. It followed God's example of, of doing the work of creating the world in seven days and resting on, in six days rather, and resting on the seventh day. Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 through 15, it commemorates their deliverance from slavery of Egypt, where they never had a day off and they could not worship their own God. God gave them the Sabbath to show them that they were a free people, free to rest from their labor and free to worship their God. Exodus 31 and verse 13. It was a sign of the covenant given uh, from Sinai between God and Israel. God had given them a day off every week for worship, for joy, for freedom, for rest. 1,500 years later, though, he had evolved into a, uh, an, uh, by an addition of hundreds of, uh, of restrictions into a legalistic, if you will, bondage that was more concerned with external behavior uh, than with human need. God gave the day of rest because people need time to relax. People need time to regroup to change their routine, to worship, and serve God without the pressure of other responsibilities. Jesus claimed authority over even the interpretation and observation of the Sabbath day, and why not? He was there, he was the one who had established it in the first place. His restoration of the spirit of the Sabbath had enraged these men that he was dealing with, these leaders, and they, of course, they sought to kill him, as we see in Mark 3 and verse 6. But here's the question. Have you ever been unjustly accused? Have you ever been unjustly accused or misunderstood, and the only thing that you could do was to go to God and say, <laughs> you must be my defender. You must reveal the truth. There is nothing I can do but trust you. Have you ever been there? These rulers, they were hypocrites. These rulers pretended to be zealous for God, to be righteous, but they were only interested in what God could do in their lives. They were not interested, I should say, in what God could do in their lives. Their hearts were cold to the fact of human need, how wrong these men were. They claimed to represent God, but they were completely doing the opposite. Jesus revealed the true heart of God when he was talking to them. Jesus exposed their hypocrisy by his true revelation of the invisible God. He hated their pretense, and they hated him before exposing it. Do you not wonder do you not wonder what he must think of the greed, of the lust, of the crimes that have been done and are being done in his name today? He still hates hypocrisy. Yet closer to home, do we make a distinction? Do we make a distinction between what the Bible actually says and what other people say it means? Do we make our application as binding as God's? That is how legalism flourishes. Also check to see if our applications are consistent and biblical. When we have a lot of rules about what we can and cannot do in order to make little loopholes that violates the very spirit of God, we need to check it out 
and think about it. Maybe you're wondering at this point if we should even keep the Sabbath today. Some people think we do, but the Sabbath was given to Israel. It is the only one of the Ten Commandments that is not carried forward into the New Testament. The disciples and the early church worshiped on Sunday, the first day of the week, to commemorate the Lord's resurrection. Sunday is the Lord's day. We do not have rules about it in the New Testament, but we do know what they did on the Lord's day. They met together, they studied God's word, they prayed, they celebrated the Lord's Supper, they gave of their means or they gave offerings. Surely the Lord's Day should have some special meaning for us today. It should be a day of worship, learning God's word, a day of service, a day of praise, a day of thanksgiving, a day that we give of our means by giving an offering. It should be a day of joy, a day of rest, and a time with family and friends. Sunday should be different from the other six days of the week. After all, we have so much to commemorate, so much more to commemorate than Israel. We have the resurrection of our Savior from the dead. Look at the effect that Jesus had on the people in the synagogue. I take you to Luke chapter 13 at verse 17. Can you imagine, can you imagine what his power and what his authority meant for the common people who were under the burden of religious and political oppression? What did Jesus reveal about God here? He revealed the compassion, the, rather the compassionate heart of God. He demonstrated that God knows everything and God he knows the cause and he knows the cure. He reveals some of God's purposes for the Sabbath. It was not a day for misery and bondage, but a day for praise and freedom. He revealed that God knows the motives of the heart and is not impressed with external behavior that mass unbelief, that mass jealousy, hatred. God hates hypocrisy. He revealed that God is greater than Satan and has authority over him. We all have weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. I need a windshield wiper. <laughs> we all have weaknesses. Do you have things that fill you with dread? when you have to face them, like fear of flying or fear of anything? Do you have, do you not have areas where you have constantly failed? Are there not relationships that you just don't, or just cannot handle? People that rub you the wrong way? Maybe your weakness is a sense of worth that you have let someone else impose on you. Maybe your weakness is a habit that you have not been able to break. Maybe your weakness is a disposition that always sees the bad side of everything. Maybe your weakness is a crippling sin that keeps you from going on to maturity in your Christian life. Is it love for money or things money can buy? Is it a desire to please people more than God? Is it a life that you would be ashamed to have projected, if you will, on a stream for all to see? Is it a selfish selfishness that keeps you from making a commitment to anything that will interfere with your own plans? Is it self-pity? Is it pride? Is it hypocrisy? Is it a violent temper? Jesus came to set us free from our weaknesses. How does he do it? First, we must come to him for help. I take, I have you note Hebrews 4 at verses 14 through 16. We come to one who can sympathize with our weaknesses. 
he was a human being living on this earth, subject to all the temptations we face, and he did not sin. He will give mercy. He will give grace to overcome. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. He may not remove our weakness, but then if he did, we will consider ourselves independent rather than interdependent. My weakness is given me to teach me something, to teach me to depend moment by moment on his power. His power is demonstrated where I am powerless. This changes my attitude toward my weakness. And that should be all of our mindsets. Instead of hating myself for failing, I can see this as God's opportunity in my life to work. God becomes real. Jesus Christ really does live out his life in me. But it is only when I admit my weakness and depend on him that I will experience his strength. This should be the thought of all of us that are here today, all who are Christians. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to say to each one of us today, man, woman, you are set free from your weakness. He calls you to come to him for freedom. He calls you to come to him for strength. The question is, will we come? Will we come? Like I said, this is some quick transition in the day. I'll take you to Luke chapter 14. Jesus was never a dull dinner, dinner guest. During his ministry from town to town, he was invited to eat in many homes. Some people were poor, some were wealthy. Regardless, he always had something to say that was worth listening to. I'm amazed to see how Jesus sets the agenda of the discussion at this particular meal. Chapter 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Jesus had been the guest of tax collectors, he had been the guest of friends, and now he's the guest of an influential Pharisee, a leader of the Pharisees. The man and his friends have invited Jesus to see how he observed the niceties of their interpretation of the law. Check that out, the niceties of their interpretation of the law. Now what ends up, ends up happening, however, is this that the Pharisees themselves are examined. Their Bible interpretation, their motives, and their values, they're all examined. Since this was the Sabbath, all the food would have been prepared ahead of time, rather than, uh, and it was, was a rather large dinner, and it included guests, uh, presumably it would have been Christ Jesus, his disciples, uh, the Pharisees' hosts, and um, fellow Pharisees. We're not sure which meal he was invited to, but it's fair to say it was more than likely the Friday evening meal because it was one of the more elaborate of the three. So as we look at verses 10 through 11, the Bible reads, But you are invited. Take the lowest place. But when you are invited, rather, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. You then will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus recommends to the group that they should take a more humble spot. Then they might be happily surprised when the host asks them to move closer to him. The moral of the story is this. For everyone who exalts himself, he will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Verse 11. We look at what's going on here, and what we find is this. One minute, Jesus uses a very 
current example of worldly jockeying for position, and in the next he is drawing a, uh, a spiritual application, if you will. It's not just a dinner, it's not just a dinner host who might humble you, but God himself might humble you. Therefore, don't presume on your position, but be humble before God. Let God exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. Now, can you imagine being disappointed at dinner? In our culture, it would have been considered rude. It is considered rude if we pull this trick at dinner. And probably in Jesus' culture as well. But Jesus is trying to teach kingdom principles here. He's trying to teach, teach kingdom principles to curious, religious, but at the same time, selfish, hardened leaders. He can't break through that hard shell without some type of uh, shock value, if you will. But Jesus' pointed comments aren't over yet. He has talked about the social climbing motives of the, of the guests. Now he turns to the host and his motives. Americans, at least in some social class, pride themselves on egalitarianism, equality for all, if you will. Now, if we would only practice it, that's the point. If we would only practice it. But cultures with a stronger awareness of class distinctions will understand this passage better. There's a room full of guests, Pharisee, Pharisees rather, the hosts, the peers, who look up to him as a leader. Jesus was the honored guest of the day, and presumably Jesus' disciples were invited as well, as was said earlier. Though he were socially inferior to the Pharisees in this town, Jesus' fame had preceded him. And so his presence brought prestige to the prominent Pharisee who wanted to be remembered in that town as the one who had hosted the famous, if unorthodox, teacher from Galilee. The dinner wasn't about helping other people. It was about helping oneself, advancing oneself, moving forward in the social uh, matrix. These guests didn't seem to be especially concerned about the man with dropsy, only whether Jesus could be charged with breaking the Sabbath or not. The meal wasn't about enjoying Jesus' company and learning from him as much as it was about enhancing one's status. And so Jesus' next parable is, a jar, is as jarring as it is apropos, if you will. Ah. So Jesus is saying, when you hold a special meal, invite those who are least able to reciprocate. Do it out of love, invite out of the goodness of your heart, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and don't look for status, but rather bless them with your generosity. Instead of letting your actions be controlled by what it would do for you, rather do what will bless someone else. Turn your focus from inward to outward. So when Jesus referred to hating, parent, hating his father and mother, he was being rhetorical. A decision for Jesus as to Christ or the Messiah in the context of Judaism could mean rejection by one's family and even persecution to the point of death. The person who feared disapproval or persecution by family desired family more than Jesus. Thus, Jesus was emphasizing that the necessity, in some cases, to forsake family 
if they were at odds with one's belief in Jesus as the Messiah. Taking one's cross refers to a commitment to the extent that, to the extent rather of being willing to die for something. Of course, in most cases where believers take up their cross, physical death is not the result. Rather, the death that occurs is the death to self and the world. Following Jesus is not something the believers should do on a trial basis. You know, I'll try it out and then see how it goes. The going will get tough, and the committed believer will be sorely tested. This is what Jesus was referring to in verses 29 and 30. Otherwise, when you have laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. The dishonor, the dishonor results from not completing the task of taking up one's cross and following Christ Jesus. For the Jew, it was the dishonor of not entering, being part of the Messianic kingdom. For the church age believer, it would be the dishonor of loss of the reward, judgment. Such a commitment requires serious consideration prior to entering into it. Verses 31 through 33, the Bible reads, Of what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all he <clears throat> who does not give up all his own possessions. Salt, <clears throat> salt that is lost is save savor or flavor. Is, use, is worthless or useless. We see this in verses 34 through 35. Therefore, salt is good, but if, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless. Either for, it is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The believing Jew was a part of a distinct nation in God's purpose. The Jewish believer and the Jewish nation were to draw the Gentiles to God through the blessings that God was able to pour out on their people due to their obedience to his laws and ordinances, which were designed to set them apart. Their obedience to the laws and ordinances could have only arisen from a heart that loved him. Salt is not only a preservative, but it, is also, but it also creates a thirst. We, like the Jewish believing nation, are to create a thirst for the word of God through our actions. As it says in the Beatitudes, bless are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Thank you all for bearing with me for a rather quick overview of Luke 11 through 14. Thank you.